So to see how space and time are supposed to tie in with this synthetic a priori knowledge, this bridge that is supposed to make knowledge possible for Kant, let's take a look at the left column on 736. He says, time and space are accordingly two sources of cognition. From these sources, we can draw a priori different synthetic cognitions, as is shown above, all by the splendid example that pure mathematics provides in regards to our cognitions of space and its relations. And that's just in reference to the idea of like geometry. So once again, you can deduce things in geometry, um, and those deductions presuppose space. So space, once again, is, is enabling us to extract new knowledge, informative information, but it doesn't do so through experience. It's a priori synthetic knowledge. Keep reading here. He says, for time and space taken together are pure forms of all sensible intuition and thereby makes synthetic proposi propositions possible a priori. But precisely thereby, by being merely conditions of sens sensibility, these a priori sources of cognition determine their own limits. Namely, they determine that they apply to objects merely insofar as they are regarded as appearances, but do not exhibit things in themselves. Appearances are the sole realm where the a priori sources of cognition are valid. If we go outside that realm, there's no further objective use that can be made of them. This limited reality of space and time leaves the reliability of experiential cognition otherwise untouched. For we have equal certainty in that cognition whether these forms necessarily attach to things in themselves or only to our intuition of those things. So, space and time are an example of synthetic a, pri a posteriori knowledge, sorry, synthetic a priori knowledge, in that they allow, a, they give the framework for thought. They're not parts of experience, it's that contribution your mind takes to experience that gives experience structure, form, the ability to think about it. And, and, and therefore, one of the things he stresses here is that space and time are necessary objective features of appearances, but that doesn't mean that they apply to the way reality is apart from our minds. If you, keep at, if you want to ask Kant, what is reality like apart from the way we think about it, he's just going to tell you we can't know that. All we can know is the reality of experience, the reality that we perceive, the reality that we think about. But um, when you try to think about what, how, is, how are things independent of our thoughts, we're incapable of having those thoughts. Questions either about, you could ask about this passage, you could ask it about space and time, or more generally what I'm trying to drive home with this big picture of Kant. There's a little bit, I think the next thing I'm going to go into is actually really helpful. But I, I, once again, just want to give you the opportunity to ask anything about Kant here. Um, it can be about a specific thing you read that I haven't addressed. Um, anything at all. I find that if I wait to let give you these opportunities till the very end of class, people will just stare at the clock and say, let us out. So, um, if you really do have a question about this, this would be a great time to ask. Yeah? Did anybody, like, talk more about this? Like any other philosophers, like keep going with this, or is this kind of like what everybody thinks is true right now? You know, there are different schools of thought. So after Kant was a philosopher named Hegel, and Hegel sort of develops more of what Kant is doing about it all being idealistic, so that there is a constantly the changing of ideas, and and that it's sort of all once again more of an idealism. There's another kind of group of philosophers that took this in a more, some would say, in a more sane direction um, that seems more or less kind of what we have more today. But there still are pretty significant debates today about, I mean, for one, most people today don't buy into the synthetic a priori knowledge. So most people think that, that 
I would say most philosophers today reject that Kant succeeded in establishing that. The other thing, though, that is interesting is to think about to what extent we do have, do, is there any kind of a priori knowledge whatsoever? So there's still quite a bit of debate on that front. There, were some, there are still some philosophers today who think ev everything is purely from experience. And so things like all bachelors are unmarried or all red things are colored things, they might say, well, maybe we'll prove those are not true someday. It's not something you can know a priori. Maybe experience will overturn it. Yeah. Can't you say though that like people created the term bachelor, so therefore you know you do gain it through experience, I guess, because it's kind of an idea that you create. Like marriage wasn't a thing that just was people created that idea. So this is so there's kind of two points here. One is like, and I think most people today would agree that you can't you're not just born with the concept of a bachelor, and Kant would agree with that as well. Um, or whether you <coughs> start talking about bachelors, we're talking about triangles. That triangles are, Kant would say, you're not born knowing what a triangle is. You learn the concept through experience. But the question is, once you have the concept, what can you deduce or what can you do once it is something you understand? Now, the other point you're making is more interesting today that people are talking about, which is to what extent does our does language and does like so do does society shape our concepts? So like marriage would be a great one, right? Something that we're struggling with in our nation right now, which is, you know, there are some people who think marriage is one definite sort of objective definition, and certain unions don't match that, therefore they're not marriages. Um, and then there are other people who, who say, well, maybe we should think about marriage differently. And what you essentially have here are competing two different ideas. One, one that says definitions and, or, about concepts are set. <laughs> they can't change. So these other, there, there's something that lies outside of that. It can never match. There's another group of people who say, well, maybe we should change our concept. Maybe concepts are socially formed things. Right. Um, Another kind of more radical way to put this, and once again, some people take Kant to be saying something like this. It's a famous hypothesis put forward called the Sapir Warp Hypothesis, which is the idea that our concepts shape reality. So the way that you think about things makes things what they are. And I've talked about this a little bit in this class as well. Um, in the metaphysics class, I showed that video of the yeah. Himba tribe, which is kind of cool, where they have different ways of thinking about colors than we do. Like they're raised having a different set of color experiences. Um, in fact, did Alex, are you the one who shared this with me initially? I don't know. Um, I think I told you about it. Anyway, um, so they have a hard time dis discriminating between colors we easily do. Like, if you put up a shade of red and a shade of blue, we easily say, oh, that these are different colors. You put those exact same cards up before people who've been raised in this African tribe, they have a very hard time telling those two colors apart. Because in their conceptual scheme, the way they've been raised, those are really similar colors. They're, they're, they're actually, they fall under the same name. They're the same color, even. But you show them very fine shades of green, they can easily tell them all apart. Because in the way they were raised, those all have different names to them. The way I've tried to kind of express this before in this class is the idea of, like, if, if all you think about with music, like, if you just think, like, so imagine somebody who's, like, really steeped in classical music. They understand the difference between, like, Baroque music, uh, um, you know, romantic classical music. Uh, you know, they, they understand, they have a whole, a very fine grained understanding of different forms of classical music. They hear, they, they have different ways of thinking about classical music than you might have. If you only, under, when you hear classical music, you just, that's one category for you. That's all it is. It's one thing. Then, you don't have as many, the way that you experience classical music is different from that way the other person experiences it because they have more ways of categorizing it and thinking about it. 
Or maybe to use a different example, if that person who knows classical music, maybe when they hear like anything, anything different, like they think of like rock, heavy metal, punk, um, you know, alternative music, all of that to them sounds the same. But if you're familiar with this kind of music, you're like, well, all those things are actually really different. They're not the same. How could you think they're the same? To that person, though, it's all the same. The way that you think, the concepts you have shape the way that reality, that you perceive reality. Now, maybe the Brianna's point is more about to what extent, so Kant thought that every human being was equipped with the exact same concepts, the same categories. One direction people have taken with this is the thought that maybe we're not all of the same. Maybe like these concepts or these categories are socially or culturally transferred. And so that maybe different cultures perceive things differently. For Kant, this idea isn't just about our perceptions of the world, it also has to do with our taste, with our sense of taste, beauty, ethics, um, all of those things as well. So once again, if all this is a matter of like what he would call pure reason, but for maybe if he turned out to be wrong about that and it was actually more about culturalization, that would have very different effects. Yeah? My, my question was kind of having to do with the colors. Uh, like, um, Say there was a like shade of color or a color that couldn't be perceived by humans. Mm -hmm. Uh, and never will be able to be. Would mm -hmm. that be an example of like the world not conforming to our uh, cognition? Or like well, so think like so like ultraviolet light, for instance, we can't perceive. Okay. We still we don't really have an idea of what ultraviolet light is like, I guess. Um, but the ways that we do think about it, it still involves us to it still involves something that our mind contributes to that because we think about it as having certain wavelengths of light. So how do we, uh, ultimately how do we conceive of wa wavelengths of light? It involves using space and time. So that is what your mind contributes to the understanding of those things. Okay. Other questions or anything else from the text? I know a lot, of, I know actually most of you have spent a lot of time reading this, which was difficult. Um, I hope the questions were actually helpful, that this wasn't just busy work, but that as you work through that, that was helpful for you to understand what's going on. Um, any questions on here that I can, anything else you'd like for me to try to address before we move on? Be, we go beyond space and time. Step through the start. So the next section, this now takes us on to 737. These quotations are another interesting way to get at the big picture point that Kant is making. So Kant claims that all of our cognition, so all of our thought, is constituted both by intuition and by concepts. So there's something that sort of your mind, your mind supplies and something experience supplies. Here's the way that he puts this. Thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. So here's what he's saying is that if you were to have, so when he says thoughts without content are empty, it's almost like saying imagine you have, you don't, your mind did not have these, these a priori categories for understanding thought, like space and time. If, if you did lack those categories for thinking about reality, and you had perceptions, you had thoughts, the problem is those thoughts would not find anywhere, like they couldn't be understood. It'd be like you'd be getting a, me a mess of information and noise with no way of sorting it out. Without having, con without having the right concepts, those thoughts that you have are, amount to nothing. Now, if you have these intuitions, meaning like these a priori understandings like space and time, 
but you don't have uh, you don't have experiences, um, you're as good as blind. Um, or actually, actually, I think it's reversed here. Sorry, but thoughts without contents would be like you have the ability to categorize things, but you don't have experience. So if you have all, like once again, so if you have space and time, those the ability to, to think in space and time, but you don't have any experiences, those categories are empty. The contents of your thought never are filled. So you wouldn't have the you wouldn't have a thought about space and time without anything else. But intuitions without concepts are blind. So if you have thoughts about the world, so if you were to have perceptions but without having those innate categories that you're born with, um, you would have all this. You would have all this sensory information, but no way to categorize it, no way to think about it, and so you're as good as blind. He says the understanding cannot intuit anything. Only from their union can cognition arise. So on his view, you need to have both something contributed from experience and something contributed from your mind. And the both and both things are actively working to create our, the way we think about the world. So if you just, to emphasize this one more time, if you just had experiences from the world and your mind did nothing, your, it wouldn't be intelligible. It would just be this cacophony of sensation that you wouldn't have any means of sorting it and understanding it and being able to intelligibly think about it. But if you have, on the other hand, all the machinery, all the content of the, the conceptualization, the categorization and to, that your mind is equipped with, but no experience, then you would have all the ability to think, but nothing to fill it with. You would, your, all of your thoughts would still be empty. You need to have the experience to, to fill your mind with content. So it's got to have both of these things. So, where we're going with this from 737 on is that he's now starting to lay out some of the way in which he thinks the mind is, has these, con, these categories, these concepts within it. So, one of the things he brings up is that all judgment, or all knowledge involves judgment. But all judgments consist of a kind of logical form or function which requires the mind to supply categories in order for those thoughts to be represented in one's mind. How does this work? The mind actively applies categories to our sensations that provide structure and interpretation to them that make them intelligible thoughts to us. And this is what's going on when you start finding all these little diagrams, right? On, you see one on 739. You've got another one on 740, 741. He's laying out his framework of what he thinks your mind is doing when you form a judgment about the world. That these, those diagrams are instances of this logical form or function that your mind supplies when you make, when you make representations of things about the world. Um, that you see things according to these kinds of categories, right? That you see things as either being universal, particular, or single. You see things that, you make judgments about things that are either affirmative, negative or infinite um, that you see and he gives all these different relations and modalities as well to try to describe the kinds of judgments that we make about things um, these judgments once again are not the, the the categories that your judgments fall under are not to be found in experience but once again it's what your mind supplies that makes experience intelligible that gives you the capacity to make judgments about experience. Let's do a comparison now between some of the, the main philosophers we've looked at and Kant. Maybe this is a better way to understand what he's up to. So Locke. A lot of people like Locke, right? The, the empiricism resonates. Um, so most people seem to really get what Locke is up to. Locke is essentially saying that substances and their primary qualities constitute reality. 
But of course we have to distinguish the way we think about reality, because that involves secondary qualities that are not really in things, compared to the substances and their primary qualities. Kant is, is one way to see Kant is like he's saying no to that. Locke's reality, what he calls reality, only exists in our cognition of reality. What Locke is talking about is only the way we think about the world. We think about substances and properties, but we have to think about them, once again, using space and time. You don't get space and time from experience. But Locke, if you remember, would say every, all of our ideas, every, every object, every idea that is in the mind, comes from experience. But you don't get, once again, the experience of space itself or of time itself, and that's the underlying reality behind all of our experiences. So what Locke is getting at isn't what reality is apart from the mind, he still is getting at what has to be part of the way we think about reality, not reality itself. Well, what about Barclay? You know, Kant is kind of an idealist, a transcendental idealist. Why, how is he different from Barclay? Barclay would say that reality consists of nothing more than ideas existing in the minds of each perceiver. That all you have are ideas and perceivers, right? Kant is different in that Kant would say, no, our thoughts are not illusory in the sense that Barclay is going to have to say, is there anything that exists outside of us? According to Barclay, no. Everything that exists, exists within our minds. Kant thinks that's, that would be a deceptive and radical illusion then. So, the sense in which, and this is a part of Kant's transcendental idealism, is that even though all we can know are our own thoughts, our thoughts are still directing us to, to the fact that something exists outside of us. Even though we can't know what it is, even though we don't know the way things are in and of themselves, that doesn't mean there is nothing <coughs> external to us. Kant would still say there really is something that exists externally to our minds. So in that sense, um, Kant is different from Barclay. Well, what's the difference between Kant and skepticism? Skeptic skeptics, so if you remember the, some of the arguments from Montaigne, some of the arguments Descartes gives in the first meditation, and of course the arguments given by Hume, they point out the fact that it's difficult to obtain knowledge of anything beyond one's own mind. That, why is that? Because there are these skeptical possibilities out there. Right? Descartes would say, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Um, Hume would say, um, how, it, how do you know that tomorrow is going to be like the past? How, is, how do you know that the things we've yet to observe are going to be like those things we've already observed? For all you know, they could be different. Um, Kant is different from that kind of skepticism in that he would say, actually, this might sound weird, but this skepticism just sort of says we don't know what the world, we, we're doubtful about the nature of, of the external world. Kant would say, actually, we can know for sure, like we've got certainty about this, and here's what we are certain about. Well, that we can't know the world as it is in itself. So e the other people just say we have no idea whether we can know what the world is like or not. Kant can almost say with definitiveness, yes, we can know that we don't know. We can know for sure that the way that the world appears to us must be a certain way, but the way that the world is, apart from our thoughts, is impossible to know. So, and here's the other part for Kant, is that we can know for sure that there is an external world, that there must be something for Kant that is giving us these ideas. It doesn't all come from within us. It just even if we can't know the way that the world is in itself. Now, this might still seem like it's a little disappointing, right? And this maybe is my beef with, with Kant, is that for all of the work that he's supposed to be doing to try to get us to overcome skepticism, it still seems like we're stuck in the same problem that everyone else was giving us. Everyone else said, 
once you enter into the world of ideas, you can't get out of the world of ideas to understand the way the world is in and of itself. You don't know the way the world, if you don't know if your, your way of thinking about the world corresponds to the way the world actually is. Well, for Kant, do we really get out of that problem? It doesn't sound like we do. It seems like Kant is just put, dressed up our minds so that he's found a neat way for our minds to contain more than experience, neato. So he's shown that, the, that contrary to Hume, there is more to our way of thinking than just what experience gives us. But that still doesn't help us on to, to have confidence or any kind of clue as to whether the way that we think corresponds to a reality independent of the way we think. And so my criticism of Kant on this front would basically be, be then, even though he's not this kind of skeptic, he still gives us skepticism. We still don't get out of the, the key problem on the way that I would criticize Questions about how Kant might be different from Locke, Berkeley, or some of the skeptics that we've looked at? How he's different from, I didn't put Leibniz up here, but questions about any of those comparisons. So, big picture things to take away from Kant. Once again, there's a sense in which he is rejecting both empiricism and rationalism. He is, I should say, leaning on the rationalist side because he says your mind has more than experience gives you. But he's not a rationalist like Descartes or Leibniz in that he doesn't think your mind already contains thoughts within it before experience. He thinks experience is what fills your mind with its content but that your mind doesn't just passively receive the content, your mind is active in also contributing to those thoughts. So there's a sense in which he's doing something different than the empiricists and the rationalists we've studied. Secondly, that our mind plays an active role in shaping our cognitions of the world. So once again, that our minds are not just passively receiving the ideas that we have, but that our minds are doing something that contributes to the way that we have thought, that it adds to experience. And that the key thing for him is the way that we can have synthetic a priori knowledge which underlies our judgments about the world. Synthetic, once again, meaning it's expansive, it in, it's informative, it gives us new information that's not already contained within our, the, the knowledge itself. And it's a priori, meaning it doesn't come from experience. It, um, it, comes from, it comes from the mind. And secondly, that that structure it imposes is necessary and universal. So synthetic a priori knowledge underlies our judgments about the world, which makes knowledge of our appearances of the world possible. If we didn't have that, we couldn't have any knowledge. Questions about Kant? Okay, um, the first point you're saying he's rejecting both empiricism and rationalism. Does he have a name for his approach? I don't know. Does he it's the big transcendental idealism. So. Transcendental idealism. Yeah, so that's, that's what the term for yeah. what he's saying. Other questions about how to put this all together? Well, that's all I got for you tonight, so it's been a great semester. Y'all have been good troopers, and uh, I'll see some of you at the final exam, and others of you, I'll say have a great time.